excuse me. And I am going to turn it oh this <laughs> turn it over to Shade Gardens with Aaron. So Aaron, you are on. Thank you so much, Peggy, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, usually I like to start by putting my video on and saying hello, but my internet was a little bit unstable. So I'm just gonna talk to you with my video off today, but it's great to have so many of you on um, to learn about native plants and shade gardens. So one of the reasons that I chose this topic is because native plants are often associated with full sun pollinator gardens. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for natives in a part shade or a full shade garden in our yard. So we'll start with just an outline of what we're going to talk about today. We've got a lot of information. If you've been in some of my webinars before, you know I like to pack it in there. So we're going to start by talking um, about why we should choose natives. We're going to talk about their ecological role in our garden. Focus specifically on why we should put shade gardens into our landscapes. We'll discuss a little bit of the when, where, and how when it comes to choosing and putting native plants in our home landscapes. And then the bulk of our time, we're going to look at some different species profiles. So give you different examples of plants that you could consider putting into your landscape. Now, we'll definitely not cover all of the options out there. There are way more than we could cover in an hour, but we just kind of wanted to start and give you some ideas of some different plants you could add. And then we're gonna finish by looking at a design idea and we're gonna use my shade garden in my backyard as our example for the day. So as we move forward, I always like to start with a quote from um, Dr. Doug Talmy. And Dr. Talmy strives to empower ordinary people like you and me to make a difference in our environment. So he says, it is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference. And when we talk about making a difference today, we're talking about making a difference when it comes to our home landscapes and supporting the ecology of our native ecosystems. So let's go back to the basics and talk about why we should choose native plants. There's many different reasons um, and just kind of depends on the angle that you look at it. But today we're gonna focus on um, <clears throat> our native um, flora that flora and fauna that we can support. So when we plant a native garden, we're providing food and habitat for native wildlife, including insects, mammals, birds, and even amphibians and reptiles. When we convert our lawn, which is typically a rather unproductive habitat, into a native planting, we can improve the productivity of that parcel of land. And by choosing native plants instead of non-native plants or cultivated plants for our gardens, we're also preventing the spread of potential non-native plants. Many of us are also familiar with the fact that native plants are very important for supporting the life cycle of our pollinators. And oftentimes we focus on the impact of native plants for providing nectar, but what is really important is their ability to serve as host plants or plants for the larval form of insects to munch on. So because of that, native plants make or break food webs. And that's because about 90% of insect larvae or other plant eating insects are only gonna eat the plants with which they have co-evolved over time. So if we have native insects in our landscapes, they're gonna be adapted to plants from that same environment. <clears throat> but why should we care? Um, we're talking about native plants today, not insects, but insects are that next level in the food web above plants. And they do a lot of hard work turning not so easy to digest plant material into um, much more easily digestible bites of food, which is themselves, right? That are much easier for birds, mammals, and amphibians to gobble up. So one thing to keep in mind with native plants is not all of them are created equal. <clears throat> and when it comes to choosing native plants that serve as host plants, only about 5% of our native plants in North America are gonna provide up to 75% of caterpillar food. So that means a small number of species provides the bulk of the food for our caterpillars. Research is showing that woody plants like trees and shrubs support the highest diversity of caterpillars when compared to herbaceous plants. Um, if you've heard about trees supporting caterpillars, you've probably seen the oak as kind of the poster child. Oaks can support over 500 different species of caterpillars across North America. 
And that's a huge number of caterpillars. When we focus on herbaceous plants that support the highest numbers of caterpillars, they're often those that grow in full sun. So where does that leave the rest of our native plants? Are they still useful? And what could we plant under our trees in a shade garden? So one of the most important roles of plants that we put in a shade garden is that they provide a safe haven for caterpillars to pupate underneath our trees. <clears throat> so if we look at this picture, where do you think a caterpillar would rather pupate? In a lush native planting or in a lawn that's mowed once a week? Okay, so just because we have trees that produce a lot of caterpillars, that doesn't mean that they're able to successfully complete their life cycle. Many caterpillars are gonna drop from trees and rely on leaf litter or other ground cover, or they're gonna bury themselves in the soil to complete their life cycle. A lawn is not necessarily the safest place for them to do that, um, but if you had a native planting under those trees, it would provide more of that undisturbed, um, good habitat for those caterpillars to then complete their life cycle. So it's taking the next step in helping to support the life cycle of these insects. So kind of tying all of that together, when we look at the ecological role of our garden, <clears throat> if we plant native plants, we can provide habitat for insects, birds, and wildlife. We can provide food, um, either for insects as host plants or our birds and other wildlife can eat some of the berries and seeds that our native plants produce. Your garden can also aid in water filtration, improve soil, and some of these plants are also really great at storing up nutrients and then releasing them later in the year. We'll talk about that when we get into spring ephemerals in a little bit. So when we think about planting natives, it's not just about the direct impact, but also providing that good habitat and building up some different ecosystem services. <clears throat> so one question that I get often um, is, is can I plant underneath my trees without harming them? And the simple answer is yes. And when it comes to people wondering if planting under your trees is going to take away nutrients from the trees, I like to say, look at nature as the example. We see plants growing underneath and right up next to our trees all over the place, and they seem to have figured it out. It gets a little bit more complicated for us because we're going to be digging into the ground to put those plants in. Um, <clears throat> but you can do this um, easily. So the, the key is to, to not completely um, dig apart an entire area around the tree, but to kind of dig smaller holes and fill in and plant those natives. And many of the natives that we're going to talk about today will spread naturally um, and can fill in those areas in a short amount of time. If you're digging and you find a root, just shift and dig a couple inches to, to one side and put your plant in there. Okay, I did provide a link to a resource that has more information about planting under your trees. Um, so you can review that as well as you get started with planting. Okay, when we talk about what plants to choose, um, I like to use this concept from a book called Planting in a Post-Wild World, um, and I'll share that on our resource page at the end as well. And in this book, they talk about um, using native plants to create gardens that mimic what you would see in nature. And what we see in nature is not plants, you know, spaced five feet apart, surrounded by a sea of mulch, like in much of our traditional landscaping. Um, but we have different layers of plants that are all structured around each other. Um, so what we're going to talk about today and break down into is three different categories. We're going to have structural plants. Those are plants like trees and shrubs, and some of our larger perennial wildflowers that could get say five feet tall. Um, that's going to form the main shape of your landscape in your yard. Okay, Ground cover plantings are really important but often overlooked. But instead of having bare soil or mulch, if you have green ground cover through sedges, ferns, and grasses, you can carpet your native garden. And then the part we typically focus on is the fun part where we add in all of those seasonal plants that are going to be all of our different pops of color. Um, in the case of shade gardens, we have spring ephemerals and we have wildflowers as well. So we're going to break, break down our plants into these categories. But before we look at different examples of those plants, where and when 
Should you, can you find these plants and should you buy these plants? And there's a lot of information out there. Um, and unfortunately the timing of this webinar is at a time where a lot of these plants are currently sold out. Um, so we're gonna prep for, for buying a lot of these plants a little bit later this year. Um, so native plants have been increasing in popularity very rapidly, um, but they also sell out very quickly um, because of that popularity. There are um, some resources listed on this page. Um, the Illinois Native Plant Society currently has lists of local native plant nurseries, and it's not just to Illinois, it's in the surrounding states as well. Um, and they have a list of native plant sales and that is regularly updated. So if you just have no idea where to start, I recommend that you visit their webpage um, and check out those links to get some ideas of places to, to order from. Um, so the timing is often a little bit different than you would expect if you are choosing to order from an online nursery. So oftentimes the order window is going to open months before those plants are ready to be shipped and will be shipped to you. So for example, this year, I put my native plant order in in January and the plants were not set to ship until May and I just got them last week. Um, so that was four months in advance, I put in my order and um, I put a little reminder in my calendar to do that because last year I thought about ordering in March and it was too late and I missed it. Um, many online nurseries have an option where you can put in your email address and it will let you know when certain plants are coming back in stock. I did that with one of the plants I wanted to order so that I knew that that order window was opening up again. Um, so you just kind of have to think a little bit further in advance than normal. Now, if you went to a farmer's market or a local native plant sale, um, most of those typically wrap up around May as well, um, but you can find some of those plants into the summertime. And then fall opens up a new window of when you can order and plant plants as well. Um, so last year I ordered some fall plants and I ordered them in October and they arrived at the end of October, okay? So spring and fall is typically the windows when those plants will be delivered. So you'll wanna order in winter and summer to get those plants in time, okay? Determining when you plant and order also depends on the life stage that you purchase your plants in. So the main three that are available are seeds, bare roots, and plugs. Seeds are the least expensive and the least reliable way to start native plants. Many of the species we're talking about today are very difficult to start from seed and it's not recommended unless you're very experienced in seed starting. So while it's more expensive to purchase bare roots or plugs, it's much faster way to establish a garden. Um, so here in the pictures, I have some bare roots that I planted um, this past fall. So I have some, um, I think this is Solomon seal rhizomes, and then I have a wild ginger. And then here, um, this spring, I ordered an entire tray of New Jersey tea. That's not for a shade garden, that's for a sunny spot, but I just wanted to show that you can also get these plugs um, as well. Oftentimes when you're researching a particular plant, if you're looking at an online nursery, it'll recommend the best form um, to purchase that plant in and the time of year that they're shipped out. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll include that information on each of the plants that we talk about today as well. Okay, um, so a couple things I wanted to mention before we get into our species profiles. Um, first up is defining shade. Um, when it comes to defining shade, we're going to use this definition listed out on the screen. And we're going to talk about light shade, partial shade, and full shade. But it's also important to know that there's dense shade, um, and we're not going to talk about any plants that um, would grow in dense shade today. But in general, Light shade is an area that receives between three to five hours of direct sunlight in the summertime. Partial shade gets two hours of direct sun or is shaded for more than half a day. Full shade is less than one hour of direct sun 
Dense is where you don't have any direct sunlight and you have very little indirect sunlight. Dense shade is areas like plantings under uh, an evergreen tree or right under a shrub. Those areas are very difficult to, to plant in um, if it's very, very dark and the, the tree grows very low to the ground. So we're not gonna talk about dense shade today, um, but I'm gonna include these, these tree symbols on each slide to show you the amount of shade that these plants are best adapted to. The next topic I want to mention is soil type and moisture. This is one of the main questions that I received prior to the webinar, um, which is, please talk about plants that do well in clay soil, and please talk about plants that do well in very dry areas. So when we talk about soil, there's a range um, between clay, loam, and sand when it comes to soil type. Most of the plants that we're going to talk about today prefer loamy soil, um, but that doesn't mean that they won't grow in clay soil, they may not just grow as well. There are certainly some that won't perform well at all and are not best suited. I'm going to try to mention ones that can do okay in clay, um, but it's also worth mentioning that the best way to improve clay soil is to add organic material. So you can do that in a variety of different ways, and there's a lot of different extension resources out there to help explain that process. Um, but adding compost is a great way to do that. So think about improving your soil as well if you do have clay. And I have clay as well, so I understand um, how difficult it can be to plant in it. Okay. Another thing to talk about is retaining moisture and understanding the gradient of moisture that um, is out there. So we're gonna use this five part gradient today from dry to wet. Most of the plants, again, are going to perform best in medium soil moisture. That's kind of our average soil moisture. But I'll again point out if some can do okay in, with a little bit drier conditions and some can do okay with a little bit wet, wetter conditions, okay? So now that we've covered a wealth of background information, we're gonna jump into our plant profiles and break it down into those three categories that we talked about already. And the first thing that we're gonna focus on is some structural plants. And for the purpose of simplifying this webinar, we're gonna assume that you already have your overstory shade trees in place in your garden, okay? So whether you have a maple tree or an oak tree, or maybe you have a cultivar of a non-native tree that's already planted in your yard. We're not gonna talk about adding those trees into our landscape, but we're gonna talk about some other structural plants like small trees and shrubs that you could potentially add into that garden, okay? And we're just gonna focus on a few. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is redbud. And redbud is a small tree that can grow between 12 to 30 feet tall. It tolerates partial shade and prefers moist to medium loamy soils, but it can also do okay with a clay loam, okay? It's a very popular landscape tree because of its pink flowers that emerge in spring before it leaves out. And then it's gonna follow those flowers with heart-shaped leaves and bean-shaped seed pods. This plant um, supports 22 different species of caterpillars, including the io moth caterpillar, it's also pollinated by bees. All right, next up is flowering dogwood, and it's another small flowering tree that can grow between 10 to 30 feet tall. It does well in partial shade to full sun um, with the same soil conditions as redbud. The flowers that you see here are later replaced by attractive green foliage, and the leaves have a pointed tip and the veins kind of curve towards the tip of the leaf. Very stunning, um, very stunning foliage. And this one I like to talk about is a great substitute for calorie pear or Bradford pear. Um, so if you don't know, um, those trees are highly invasive. And um, if you're like me, you're going to cut yours down in your yard to get rid of it. But if you want something in its place that's going to have white flowers before it leaves out, dogwood is a great option. The amazing thing about dogwoods is they support over a hundred species of caterpillars. 
including the hickory horned devil. If you've never seen one of those caterpillars, it's quite striking. Um, and bees and flies are gonna visit this tree and the berries that it produces are gonna be eaten by birds and some of our small mammals. Another really great shrub to small tree is service berry. And again, it grows 10 to 30 feet tall. It can tolerate moist um, to dry medium soil and it does well in loam or sandy soils or rocky soils. So it's a little bit more diverse in, in its ability to grow. Um, it does well in par partial shade to full sun. And it's often a multi-stemmed um, shrub or tree. And this is another one that will flower before it puts out leaves. So I think this is another stunning um, substitute for calorie pear. It will support 91 species of caterpillars, including the red spotted admiral caterpillar. And the flowers are often visited by bees and flies and its fruit is eaten by birds like the cedar waxwing and Baltimore Oriole. Okay, if we shift into shrubs a little bit more, um, spice bush is a shrub that likes light to full shade and can grow um, between six to eight feet tall. Um, it likes medium to medium wet loamy soil. Um, this one, I think is the first one we have my deer resistant symbol on the screen. Um, so in general, um, it's not preferred by deer. I'm never gonna say that it's never gonna be browsed by deer because deer don't follow the rules. Um, so they may get a nibble, but in general, um, because of the, the odor um, that these leaves have, they're not preferred by deer. It has beautiful, delicate yellow flowers in the spring. Um, and its leaves will turn yellow in the fall and it produces bright red berries. Um, and it supports 10 species of caterpillars as well. If you've never crushed a leaf of spice bush, it's a very, very pleasant um, aroma. Okay, and the last structural plant that we'll talk about is winterberry holly. Um, and it is a shrub that can grow five to 10 feet tall prefers partial shade, but it can do okay in full sun or full shade. Um, it likes medium to wet soil and it does okay if you have a slightly acidic soil, if you have some peat or sand, um, it can do well in those conditions. Um, it is a quite a popular landscape plant, so this one may not be new to you. Um, and it's important to note that it is dioecious, so there are separate male and female plants. Um, and oftentimes, if you buy them young enough, um, the nurseries won't know if it's a male or a female. So your best bet is to buy at least two to get the chance of having berries. Um, hollies can support 41 species of caterpillars, including sphinx moths, polyphemus moths, and oak slug moth caterpillars. If you've never seen a picture of an oak slug moth caterpillar, look it up because they are very interesting looking. Um, they are pollinated by bees and their berries are not often um, a preferred food source, but they serve as a backup food source because they'll last into the winter time. All right, so we've covered just a few structural plants. We're gonna spend the majority of our time looking at the seasonal plants. Um, like I mentioned before, these are ones that we're often most excited to add into our garden because they add those pops of color, that different seasonal interest. They're the ones that we often see being visited by pollinators. Um, so we're gonna talk about both spring ephemerals, which are very common in woodland shade gardens, and then other wildflowers. So one thing to note is it's really easy to pick all of your favorite spring ephemerals to add into your shade garden. But remember that true ephemerals are going to die back completely to the ground by the summertime. So if you just plant spring ephemerals, by summertime, you'll have bare ground left behind. Um, so make sure you intersperse them with ground cover plants and other um, wildflowers who will retain their foliage throughout the entire season. But we'll start with some of the ephemerals. Um, so first up is Virginia bluebells. Um, this is a spring ephemeral that will spread over time to form colonies. Um, it prefers partial to full shade, but you can also find it growing in sunnier areas. 
It likes medium soil. It can handle when conditions get a little bit wet um, and it likes loam. The plants will get about one to two feet tall. And like I said, the foliage will die off by the middle of summer. When it comes to planting these, choosing bare roots is the way to go. And you can put them in in either spring or fall. This plant can do okay in clay um, and generally it's deer resistant. Um, and if you have poor soils or clay soils, it can reduce its ability to spread and form those colonies. So it might spread at a slower rate. Um, this one is visited by long-tongued bees and it provides cover for wildlife if you do get a large colony of it. Okay, spring beauties are up next and they are a long lasting spring ephemeral. They're often one of the first to start blooming. And just the other day I saw some still blooming two months after the first ones started. They prefer light to full shade but I have them growing in my lawn um, in full sun. And it's not uncommon. Um, you may have some growing in your lawn as well. Um, they like moist to medium loamy soil. They are very short, only three to six inches tall. And the foliage is gonna die back by the middle of summer. For these bare roots, you'll want to plant them in the summertime. So you can still order them late winter, They'll just wait to ship them to you in the summer and then you'll put them in the ground in the summertime. Um, since it is one of the first to bloom in the spring, it's a really important um, source of um, food for early foraging insects. And it does have a specialist pollinator, um, a specialist bee that visits it. Um, this one, the, the corms, um, that's the underground root structure, can be dug up by mice and chipmunks sometimes. So just watch out for that if you are putting them in the ground. Okay, woodland blue phlox is another long lasting spring ephemeral. Um, it's another one that will spread over time um, throughout your space, but it doesn't spread very quickly. Um, prefers light to full shade and a medium loamy soil. Usually it stays under two feet tall. Um, and the best way to plant it is with bare roots in spring or fall. Um, rabbits and deer do like to browse this one. So if you have a huge abundance of them where you live, might not be the best um, plant to choose. Um, and then if you do have some of the, these plants um, that don't flower in a given year, their foliage will last longer through the summertime. But if, you, if they are flowering, that foliage will die back by the summer. Okay, Jacob's Ladder is another spring ephemeral um, that can grow anywhere from full sun to full shade. So it's not really picky on its, on its sunlight preferences. Um, it prefers medium loamy soil and it is a relatively short plant that grows from six to 18 inches. You can plant plugs um, of, so potted plants or small plugs of these plants in spring or fall or you can plant bare roots in spring or fall as well. Sometimes um, I, my personal preference is to see the plant. I like having the actual foliage to plant in the ground because I know that it's at least come up once <laughs> rather than a bare root that you put in the ground and then just hope that it comes up the next year. Um, and sometimes the availability differs depending on where you're ordering it from. So either of those works for putting that one in. Um, it is deer resistant and not an aggressive spreader, um, and it spreads by seeding rather than um, vegetatively spreading. Um, so overall, I think it's a really lovely plant to have um, in your garden. Okay, another early spring ephemeral is bloodroot, and it's quite a fleeting plant, so its blooming window is pretty short compared to many of the other ephemerals, um, and it, it, it will go dormant in the summer. The flowers emerge with a small leaf wrapped underneath the flower. You can see that in the picture here. Um, and then after the flowers bloom, the leaves will continue to grow in size. So the leaves can get at least six inches across. I've seen some that were 10 inches across. Um, I, I couldn't believe it was a blood root. Um, they enjoy partial to full shade um, in a medium loamy soil. And the best time to plant it is in the spring or fall with the bare root. Um, this one is deer resistant um, because it has 
um, a toxic reddish juice inside the stems um, and the roots, hence the name blood root. Um, and it does support one species of caterpillar. And one thing to note with blood root and many of the other spring ephemerals is their seeds are actually spread by ants. The seeds have an oil body on them um, that is very nutritious and delicious for ants. So they collect the seeds and take them back to their food storage area and eat the oil body and discard the seed. And when they discard the seed, they're planting it in a new spot. Okay, so if you have spring ephemerals and they are popping up all over where you planted them, it was probably the ants that helped move them around. Okay, some of my favorites are the trout lilies. We have white and yellow trout lily. And these are ephemerals that will spread over time to form colonies in your garden. And patience is required with these if you want them to flower because it takes a minimum of seven years for them to mature enough to flower. Um, if you've been in the woods, oftentimes you'll see them, um, their, their individual leaves completely carpeting um, the forest floor in the early spring. And when they develop two leaves is when they have matured enough to flower. Um, they do well in light to partial shade and medium to medium wet loamy soils. They grow about six inches tall and do best when you plant bare roots in spring or fall. Um, so I planted a white trout lily in bare root in the fall in my garden and it emerged this spring um, and they will die back by the summertime. There's a really interesting um, hypothesis that's being studied specifically with trout lilies. Um, that looks at how they serve as nutrient sinks to soak up nutrients um, that could be lost from the woods during spring melt and rainfall. Um, so they've been found to store up nitrogen and potassium um, during their growing season. And then when they die back in the summer, they release those nutrients back into um, the soil at a time where more of the vegetation is greening up in the summertime. Um, so really interesting. Um, look at reserving nutrients for some of our other plants. Um, and trout lilies are ones that um, have been studied to do that. Okay, celandine poppy is probably my favorite spring ephemeral, although it's hard to choose just one. And it will do well in partial to full shade. It can tolerate soil that's on the bit, a bit of the drier or the wetter side of medium. Um, and it prefers loam. The plants will grow about one foot tall and it will spread um, through reseeding through your garden. Um, you can plant bare roots in spring or fall. That's the best way to get that one established. Um, and the foliage is toxic to mammals, so you shouldn't have too much browsing um, by, by deer or rabbits. Okay, our last spring ephemeral we'll talk about is wild hyacinth. Um, it does well in full sun to partial shade. Um, in medium wet to medium dry soils that can be acidic or have clay in them. Um, they get about two feet tall and um, they're not the fastest growers, but they are long lived plants. So if you put them in your garden, they should return year after year after year. I'm excited because I ordered one of these for my garden. Um, I ordered it in January and this is one. Um, that you want to plant in summer or in the fall. So it is set to be shipped to me in the summertime and that's when I'll put it into my garden. All right, let's shift to some of our other wildflowers that we can find in the woods. Um, Blue cohosh is another one that I added to my garden this past fall. It prefers partial to full shade and medium loamy soil, um, but it can tolerate clay. They'll grow about one to three feet tall and they produce these really unique green flowers um, that I have pictured here that I think are just stunning. Um, plant the, the bare roots in spring or fall. And then those flowers are gonna be re replaced by blue berries um, and they're not edible to humans. Um, just putting that out there, please don't eat them, they're toxic. Um, but birds will eat and spread the seeds. Um, and another reason for the name blue cohosh is the stem is rather blue or blue green in color. And this one supports two different species of caterpillars. Okay, um, another plant is black cohosh. 
not closely related to blue cohosh. They're not in the same genus. This plant's also called black snake root or bug bay. You may have heard some of those names associated with it. Um, <clears throat> it's another woodland wildflower, but it's rather rare in Illinois, um, but it is available in native plant nurseries. Um, it can grow quite large, between three to seven feet tall, so you could include it as a, a more of a structural element of your garden as well. Um, this one is deer and rabbit resistant um, because the foliage is toxic. And it can do okay with some dry periods of time, but prefers medium soil. And it does well in partial to full shade. This one, unlike the spring ephemerals, blooms May through September. And then you can plant it in spring or fall with a bare root is the preference for this one. Okay, red baneberry is up next and it's related to and similar in appearance to doll's eyes. If you're familiar with that plant, it just has berries that look different. Um, again, it's not super common in Illinois um, since Northern Illinois is at the Southern extent of its range. Um, but what you will find is it produces clusters of white flowers that are then replaced by these clusters of red berries. Um, one thing to note is the whole plant is toxic to humans, including the berries, so please don't eat them. And the toxicity of the plant, though, makes it deer resistant. Um, it prefers light to full shade and um, moist, to, um, moist to medium soil that can be acidic, sandy or have clay in it. So again, tolerates a broader range of soil conditions. Um, and it does prefer cooler weather. So it's probably not the best suited choice um, for me where I'm located in Southern Illinois, but if you're in the opposite end of the state where Peggy's at, um, it, it's a better choice for your gardens there. This one, you can plant bare roots in spring or fall. All right, golden alexanders is a great plant that does well in full sun, but can also tolerate some partial or light shade. Um, it's a good plant to have in your garden to transition from your spring ephemerals into your flowering summer plants um, because it will bloom for about three weeks um, around May into June. It isn't necessarily the longest lived perennial species, but it, it should reseed itself um, after, after it fades away. Um, and it does well in dry or wet medium soils. So it can tolerate soils that aren't um, on that average spectrum, but are a little bit wetter or a little bit drier. Um, it's best planted as a plug or a potted plant in spring and fall. Um, it will get about three, three feet tall as well. And it supports four species of caterpillars, including the black swallowtail. Um, and it's often visited by bees, wasps, flies, and beetles. Okay, our last wildflower that we'll mention is a goldenrod, and we couldn't have a native plant webinar without talking about goldenrod. Goldenrod has a really bad reputation, um, but it's important to note it's not responsible for your allergies. Um, and there are some smaller, more well-behaved species um, in comparison to the ones that we see taking over empty fields or roadsides. Um, so I chose this one in particular, blue stemmed goldenrod, um, because it is apparently pretty well behaved in a shade garden. Um, it has arching stems and clusters of flowers along the leaf axles, so it's a little bit of a different look on a goldenrod as well. The stems can be bluish in color, um, or something called glaucus, and that means that it has a powdery white coating on it that rubs off. They prefer partial to full shade and medium or drier soils that can be loamy, um, clay, or rocky. It blooms in the fall, August through October, and that's why we really like goldenrods because it extends the season of blooming flowers way into the fall. Um, it does best when it's um, uh, planted from a plug in spring or fall. Um, it is deer resistant and can support 112 species of caterpillars. That's why we like goldenrod because it is an herbaceous plant that supports, I want to say the highest or the second highest um, number of caterpillar species. It's visited by short-tongued bees, wasps, and flies as well, and the seeds can be eaten by some birds. 
All right, so lastly, we're gonna look at some plants that you can use as ground cover. Um, and they're gonna vary in height, but include sedges, grasses, and ferns, as well as some wildflowers that are typically chosen and planted mostly for their foliage. And a lot of the times um, we kind of default to a hosta in a shade garden. Um, I'm guilty, I have hostas in my shade garden and we don't get excited about the different types of greenery that we can add into our landscape, but there's a lot more options out there than you might think. Um, and, and like we mentioned earlier, it's important to consider um, putting that ground cover in there as well to have kind of that, that background um, cover instead of mulch um, throughout our garden. So let's look at some ground cover plants. Okay, first up is wild ginger. Wild ginger emerges in the spring, but its foliage will remain throughout the growing season. Um, it prefers full shade, but can do okay in part shade and likes medium loamy soil, but can do okay if the soil is a little bit acidic as well. Um, it is a spreader and it will form colonies. And, and hopefully you've seen that theme throughout the webinar as well, um, that many of these are their, their spreaders, that's their natural form. Um, so if you want a garden that is plants growing in a clump spaced out from other plants, that's not necessarily what's gonna happen if you plant these plants, okay? Um, it produces a dark red flower that you can often find under the leaf cover. It's at the base of the plant. Um, this one is deer resistant and supports one species of caterpillar. And you can plant bare roots in the spring or fall for this one. Okay. Um, while wild ginger is often really um, popular in native plant um, gardens, one that I don't really hear a lot about is pussy toes. Um, and I think they're a great ground cover option. There's a couple different species um, and there's two species that I've seen for sale. Um, one is a prairie pussy toes that does better in, in more full sun conditions. Um, and then there's one that's just called pussy toes um, that does better in shaded areas. Um, they're only a couple inches tall and they're grown um, in a garden for their, their ground cover um, foliage, but they do produce small white um, clusters of flowers that resemble cat feet, hence the name. Um, but the, those flowering stalks only get four to 12 inches tall. The leaves are usually only a couple inches off of the ground. For this one, you can plant them um, as bare roots or as plugs, and they do best when they're planted in the spring. Um, they are typically not eaten by deer, um, but I have seen some reports of them being eaten by deer, so it could go either way. Um, and they do support three different species of caterpillars. All right, Solomon's seal is a wildflower and a taller ground cover. It can grow in any light from full sun to full shade, um, does well in medium or medium dry soil. And while it prefers loam, it can grow well in poorer soil as well. Um, this one can grow up to four feet tall, but I often see it around two feet tall and it arches to the side as you can see in the picture. Um, it has flowers that dangle under the arched leaves. Um, I, I included this picture earlier, but um, you can see the flowers developing right here. So it's really understated. Um, if you see it from the top, you'll mostly just see that foliage. Um, let's see, plant the bare roots in spring or fall, and it will spread over time to form colonies. The, bear, the, the flowers are replaced with berries later in the summer or fall, and the leaves will turn a golden color as well in the fall. I think with this one, I did. I put two pictures on this one because I just saw it um, blooming the other day. So I had to snap that picture where you can see those cream colored flowers in bloom underneath the leaves. Okay, um, another one that looks similar is false Solomon seal, also called Solomon's plume. Um, and it has foliage that's really similar to Solomon seal, but you'll notice that the flowers are in a cluster on the, the tip of the plant rather than held under the leaves, okay? Um, it does well, again, full sun to full shade, medium wet to dry soil. And it's a little bit shorter and smaller than Solomon's seal, about two feet tall. Um, this one spreads slowly through your garden. It spreads through rhizomes. There's another plant that looks very similar called Starry Solomon's Plume. 
That one, it is native, but it spreads much more aggressively. So if you're looking for a quick and easy ground cover, you can put that one in. But if you want it to spread slowly, um, false Solomon seal is, is a good choice. Um, oftentimes you won't find deer browsing um, this plant, but they will browse the real Solomon seal. So the last plant that we just looked at. Okay, we're gonna look at a few ferns next. Maidenhair fern is our first one. If you're looking for an alternative to hostas, ferns are a great choice. Um, this one is really interesting in the U-shape arrangement that it holds its fronds in, and the stems are wiry black. Um, they grow up to two feet tall and spread slowly through rhizomes. They do well um, in medium wet soils, but maidenhair ferns will also do okay if the soil is a little bit drier. Um, so contrary to what you might picture as fern habitat, um, these ones can do okay if, if the soil's a bit drier. For these, you'll want to plant the bare roots in the spring, and it's been um, studied to be deer resistant. Our next fern is Christmas fern. Um, it's one of my absolute favorites. It is going to stay green year round, and you can plant it in light to full shade, medium to medium dry, loamy soils. Um, this is one that doesn't do well in clay. So if you have clay soil, stay away from Christmas fern. Um, you can plant bare roots in the spring or the fall. It's um, been shown to be deer resistant and support three different species of caterpillars. And our last fern, but probably my favorite is sensitive fern. Um, it has a little bit of a different look than many of our other ferns. It has really wide um, fronds rather than more of the delicate, um, really intricate patterns that you see in some of the other ones. Um, it does well as long as it doesn't encounter long periods of drought and you can grow it in full sun to full shade. It will also spread slowly through rhizomes. And for this one, you'll want to plant the bare roots during the spring. Um, it is deer resistant and supports five different species of caterpillars. Um, it gets its name sensitive fern because it um, will often die back after the first frost of the year. Okay, we're going to talk about one grass. Um, so beak grass is a great choice for a lower growing spreading grass, does well in part to full shade, medium wet to medium dry loamy soil. It spreads through creeping rhizomes. And the leaves and seeds bend over to the side. And I really wanted to highlight the seeds in the picture here because um, I think they're really um, an interesting shape. Um, this one is deer resistant and has been found to be resistant to um, jug loam that's produced by black walnut trees. So if you're looking for a plant to put under a walnut tree, beak grass should be able to stand up to the test. And then the leaves will turn tan in the fall. For this one, you'll want to choose a potted plant to put in in late spring or early summer. Okay, and we're going to finish up our species profiles by looking at a couple sedges. Sedges are another really great option for shade gardens as ground cover, and we often overlook them. Um, but there's a huge number of different sedges that are available and for sale from native plant nurseries. Um, so this one is Pennsylvania sedge. Um, it somewhat resembles a lawn grass. So if you're looking um, to put in a, a substitute for grass in a shady spot in your lawn, um, this is a good option. It stays under eight inches tall and can do well in drier soil. Um, and it can spread, um, it can spread between three to eight inches per year. Um, and you can then divide it to, and, and spread it out further to help it spread faster. Um, it's been shown to be deer resistant and it is recommended to plant either bare roots or potted plants in fall or spring. And our last plant of the day is gray's sedge or burr sedge. Um, it is a taller sedge, you can get up to three feet tall that prefers wet to medium soils. It forms clumps that will spread slowly and can do well full sun to full shade. Um, this one is deer resistant and um, you can plant the bare roots in spring or fall. Okay, so we've made it through our species profiles and I wanted to close out today by giving you an example of how to take that overwhelming amount of information and turn it into a design idea. Um, 
And another thing to mention is just because you wanting to add native plants into your garden doesn't mean you have to rip out everything that you have existing, okay? Um, you can still make an impact and provide um, really great ecosystem services and habitat by um, retaining some of your existing plants and just adding natives in. Um, so you'll see here, this is a picture of my garden. Um, last fall, I dug up and divided and replanted all of my hostas. Um, so I'm not getting rid of the hostas, I like them. Um, but this area in the front here is where I am planning to add in my native plants. Um, I have to get rid of this rogue hosta that didn't get moved. Uh, but if you see pink flagging, that's where I planted some of my bare roots last fall. So let's look at what I decided to do. Again, trying not to make this overwhelming, but it's really helpful to sketch out your garden and kind of um, space out what plants you have and see what room you have to work with. So here is kind of my existing um, non-native vegetation. Got my trees that form my shade. I have all of my hostas lined up. I've got a viburnum, a hydrangea, and a group of irises. Okay. What I decided to add last fall was a white trout lily, some ginger, some blue cohosh, and some Solomon seal. Okay, so I kind of started with this section of my garden. I'm expecting those plants to spread and fill in some of that blank space. Um, I ordered my wild hyacinth that's going to go in this spot when I get it later this summer. And then I'm hoping to add in celandine poppy and Virginia bluebells. Maybe put some sedge underneath them because they're ephemerals. They'll fade away in the summertime. And then with that blank spot in the back, I love sensitive fern. So I'm going to start with one to see if it tolerates my clay soils. And if it does, then I want to order a whole bunch and, and back them all in this way, okay? So this, again, is just one example. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying out. Um, and I'm hopeful that I can start to incorporate natives in among um, my current landscaping and still make it look really aesthetically pleasing, but then start to improve and add some of those ecosystem services that we've talked about. Okay, so I wanna close today. Um, by giving a couple lists of plants and I have them so that they're in the webinar recording so you can reference it later. Um, a lot of people asked about what plants to put in dry shade and in clay soil. So I wanted to provide some, some lists of those. So for dry shade, when it comes to flowering plants, you've got thimbleweed, columbine, hairy beard tongue, wild geranium, woodland phlox, and that blue stemmed goldenrod we talked about. For ground cover, you can look at wild strawberry and false Solomon seal. Um, those in multiple spaces that I looked have been recommended for dry areas. And then when it comes to clay, um, when we talk about structural plants, we've got viburnums and our red twig dogwood can do okay and tolerate clay. When it comes to flowering plants, doll's eyes, bluebells, blue star, and golden alexanders can tolerate that soil. And when we look at ground cover, cinnamon fern and tufted hair grass are some other options to research and look into. I know that was a lot of information really fast, but I wanted to just have those lists there specifically um, since those were um, questions that I received prior. Okay, last up, I wanna mention some resources. Um, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant has put out a really great native spring ephemerals guide to choosing ones to put in your home garden. Um, I also included a resource um, with some plants for clay soils um, by the Missouri Botanical Garden. That planting under trees resource that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. And then a couple different books, Native Plants in the Home Landscape um, by Keith no Nowakowski and Planting in a Post-Wild World that I talked about um, by Thomas Reiner and Claudia West. Again, the links um, were emailed to you and I, um, you can check that email, and I think Peggy's going to put them in the chat box as well. I just did. They're already there. Great. So with that, um, I just want to promote our next Everyday Environment webinar, um, Protecting Water Quality. Um, this is going to be on June 10th at 1 o'clock. Um, so you can go to go.illinois.edu slash water quality to sign up for that one. And then today, um, we do have an evaluation. Um, if you're willing to take a couple minutes and fill that out, um, it's really helpful feedback for us. So you can go to the QR code um, or visit that URL that we'll get in the chat box as well. And you will be receiving a follow-up email with that information um, for you too. So if you just wanna wait to get the email, that's fine. We'll provide that for you um, shortly. 
So with that, I wanna thank you all. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Um, Peggy, if there are any questions, I can stay on a little bit past two and we can see um, how many of those we can answer. Yes, there were some really good questions and I actually started writing them <laughs> and then went, no, this is impossible. So let me do just one more thing in the chat, everybody. I'm trying to make sure I get all of Aaron's uh, information and links. And remember, you know, we don't... Uh, we don't give out our PowerPoints because they're going to be re they're recorded. So don't forget when you get the recording, if you want to just go to any of the lists or pictures, you can fast forward, you, you know, for any of those things. And I did put all of those resources and um, the evaluation. All of that is in the chat. So keep your eye on that chat. I'm going to open up my chat into a bigger screen <laughs> because it's so hard to read this little tiny box and to watch everything. And we may I will do my best. We may not get to everybody's um, questions today, and I apologize ahead of time for that. I'm cruising through. The first one, way back when, Kathleen uh, asked Aaron if you would by chance suggest adding topsoil, um, on, you know, when you're going around this tree to put plants in, and you were saying dig carefully, and she asked if it would be okay to put topsoil on there first and then plant in the topsoil. Um, I didn't know what you thought of that. I assume that would oh. be roots so yeah it, it it depends one thing that we don't want to do that we see a lot of the time is like adding in a raised bed around your tree right where you'd um bring in you know six inches of soil and put that around your tree that's not going to be healthy for your tree so it kind of depends on your specific situation um if you have a lot of erosion around your tree you may want to backfill some in um if you're adding in anything you know keep it about two inches per year and then you can try to work that soil in um, being careful around your tree roots but we just want to make sure we're not adding in a huge dump of soil <laughs> around our tree mm -hmm. so that's not going to be healthy for the tree right um joy asked if i want to start a shade garden under an existing tree and i have just a small mulch ring should i remove the existing grass you know before making the shade garden bigger yes so you can um there's several different methods for removing um, lawn grass and killing off that lawn grass. Um, kind of depends on the time of year and how long you want to wait to do that. Um, you can cover it with black plastic and, in the summertime and then it will kind of cook it. <laughs> um, if you want to get started right away, you can lay cardboard down um, and put soil on top. Again, right, we don't want to add a huge amount and you probably won't be able to plant deep into that. So that doesn't really work for shade gardens. That works for like raised bed gardens. Um, but yeah, there's there's a bunch of resources on Extension's website on removing existing lawn grass. So I encourage mm -hmm. you to, to check those out um, for some different ideas of ways you can do that. Nice. Another question, when you say dogwood supports the caterpillars, is it just Cornus Florida or would the other ones also support caterpillar species? So for each, for each of the caterpillar species, um, it's the the collection of oh. that group of plants in that genus that's native. So it would be the native dogwoods um, in our area. And I should have mentioned, I didn't mention, that was for my zip code in Southern Illinois, um, mm -hmm. those numbers of caterpillars. So if you're in a different area, it could range, but it should mm -hmm. be somewhat close to that. But yes, for that one, it was for the native dogwoods that we have in Illinois. Uh, in relation to that, so, are, there was another one about um, how about the disease problems with dogwoods and then uh, are our natives able to survive in central Illinois? And I th I've seen dogwoods in central Illinois, so I would, I would guess that they would be there, right? It, yeah, it would depend on their, their specific range. And for that one, I am not super mm -hmm. familiar with its range throughout Illinois. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think we used to have them in the Illinois River Valley, which yeah. yeah. So I and again, if you're there are some plants, right? I pointed out that are better for northern Illinois rather than southern Illinois. Um, sometimes I'll I'll be that person that's like, but I really want that plant. I'm gonna try and see if it'll sure. if it'll live in my area. And just know that if you're if you're planting a plant that's not suited for your specific 
area, it might not do as well and it might not live as long. So that's a risk that you're, you're taking to do that. Um, but there's tons of range maps, um, usdaplants.com. You can go there and search any native plant, any non-native plant, and it'll tell you where it's found um, in, in our area. So if you wanna check out and get that detailed, you can do that as well. Nice. Uh, someone asked if the forest pansy red dog or red redbud, the forest pansy redbud would be as good as an original species of redbud when it, I'm assuming when it comes to caterpillars and, and support. I'm assuming that's a cultivar. In general, I recommend getting the, the wild type native species if you can. Um, if you're choosing a cultivar, there is a chance that that plant has been altered in a way that reduces its wildlife value. Um, not always. There are definitely cultivars that still have benefits for our native insects and our native wildlife. It kind of depends on what's been changed. If leaf color has been changed, that could be a big deterrent. Um, it, it, just, it just kind of depends. If the flower shape has changed, then pollinating insects may not be able to find um, that flower in the same way. So in general, that's, that's my recommendation is to get the wild type if you have it, but if you already have one existing, by no means am I telling you to cut it down or replace it with a wild type. Uh -huh. um, so it kind of depends on your, your personal preference. Um, and, and that research is starting to happen. I will say there is a lot more interest um, in studying cultivars of natives to see if they have those same, those same benefits. We're just not quite at the point where a bunch of that research has been done and has come out yet. Okay. Quick, a couple more here. Golden Alexander, um, is it a plant that stays green through the summer? Yes, that one will. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and, moving... and with that one, really quick, uh -huh. I'll also mention there's a heart-leaved Alexander's as well. Oh, it wow. does well in, in a little bit wetter areas, um, but has a different leaf shape. So check that one out as well. Um, making one of these questions kind of short, do spring beauties transplant well? Somebody has one by a driveway and they really would like to move it to a safer place, but they don't want to kill it either. Um, I haven't tried it, so I'm not sure. Um, the fact that, I, I, I don't know, the fact that they're in my lawn and we mow them all the time, they come back. Um, they seem pretty hardy, but I don't know how they take to transplanting. Um, so you could right. try moving one and see if it comes up, flag it and see if it comes up. Um, but I'm, I'm not quite sure on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, what about purchasing May apples? Do some of those places where we buy our natives, do they offer May apple? Um, Peggy, do you know? I want to say I've seen them on where you can order them. I'm, I, you know, I feel like if you get the right um, organiz, you know, right retailer, right organization, you probably can. It might yeah, not be so, where you have fewer. It might be where there's a, a more quantity and more choice space. Mm -hmm, I want to mm -hmm. say where I get mine out of what Minnesota that they have them. Yeah, I feel like I've seen them available. Mm -hmm. And and wild ones, everybody, if you have a chapter of wild ones um, in your area, I just purchase a lot of plants from my wild ones to support them and because I get really good plants from them. And so I hate to say it, but I'm not supposed to preach anything, But but my thought is, we have people on here um, from Indiana, Nebraska, Aaron. So you might have a wild ones chapter and you can usually trust that as a, as a safe, because somebody was asking about concerns about getting, you know, good plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aaron didn't just say that I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take the hit for it. All right. Well, we're really, really past our time. So I apologize if we didn't get to um, your questions, Aaron, that was awesome. I, I, might have missed a few things in the, it, I kept having to recheck the chat because you had me completely writing notes. Again, you just know so many things that I don't have the lots of little pieces. So I appreciated all your time and everybody, thank you for your time. Don't forget to watch your emails, not right away, but um, those links are there in the chat, but those will be coming in an email for you to be able to view it at your leisure uh, once again. Um, and, and so thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peggy. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.